the Catholic Men's Podcast, helping you find good works of literature for the Catholic gentleman. Sea Wolf, the daring exploits of Navy legend John D. Bulkley. In June 1960, Bulkley eagerly opened orders that would disclose his next assignment and challenge. He was stunned. America's most decorated warrior was being sent to command the super-secret nuclear modification center outside Clarksville, Tennessee, about as far from the ocean as a Navy man could get. There was no solace in knowing that experiments crucial to national security were being conducted at that center. Quote from Alice Bulkley, his wife. I had never seen John so disheartened. He even toyed with the idea of resigning from the Navy he had always loved so dearly. John was convinced that the Navy brass were putting him on a back burner, that at age 48 he was being sidetracked to a job as a paper shuffler and had reached a dead end in his career. The Admiral's stars he had coveted since boyhood now seemed to be fading away. After two weeks of reflection, Bulkley decided to report to the Nuclear Modification Center located 50 miles north of Nashville on the Kentucky border. The 5,000-acre facility was a self-contained Navy enclave nestled within sprawling Fort Campbell, Kentucky, home of the 101st Screaming Eagles Airborne Division. The nuclear center was surrounded by a sturdy chain-link fence and guarded by a contingent of 700 Marines. Inside the enclosure was a huge building that was used as a weapons modification laboratory and many igloo-type structures in which scientists, physicists, and technicians worked. Hardly had Bulkley driven through the front gate for the first time than he realized there was a major disciplinary problem at the Nuclear Modification Center. Almost at once, he isolated the cause. The daily monotony of peacetime duty that steadily eroded many officers' sense of leadership and responsibility. The entire complex was a festering sore, wrote Admiral Bulkley. Accidents, booze, and brawls were the norm. The snot-nosed middle-rank officers, who had never come any closer to armed combat than their boot camp training, had established little rings of power. For the most part, they weren't kids. They were misguided twits who needed a kick in the caboose. Abuse of authority was rampant, and no one seemed to give a darn. Plain and simple, all this monkey business was going to grind to a screeching halt. Bulkley's task to correct the situation would be even more difficult due to the fact that the overall installation was a joint armed forces operation, with Fort Campbell and the Nuclear Modification Center each having its own commander. The Navy skipper soon learned that a rivalry between the Fort Campbell Airborne men and the Nuclear Center's Marines had gotten out of control. A certain amount of spirited contention was normal and even beneficial to both services, Bulkley knew, but brutal clashes could result in a hazardous climate for working and living on and around the military facility. Captain Bulkley worked with the Fort Campbell Commanding General to set up Joint Marine Army Military Police Patrols to make the rounds of the sleazy saloons clustered outside the gates and in adjacent towns. When Marines or Navy men were hauled in by the MPs, Bulkley threw the book at them and made certain that the offender's fate was widely publicized at the center. Bulkley asked military surplus stores to stop selling handguns and knives to servicemen, and most outlets complied. Those that ignored the request were visited by Navy officers, who reminded them of their financial loss should their outlets be placed on the off-limits list. Each reluctant store owner fell into line. Security had always been Captain Bulkley's number one priority. He was fond of citing the case of the fabled Trojan horse as proof that an unbeatable foe can be vanquished by its enemy through tricks that penetrate a military position. Within hours after taking command at the nuclear center, Bulkley called in the colonel in charge of the Marine force to be briefed on the facility's security system. The center's security was tight as a drum, the Marine officer assured Bulkley, and could not be penetrated by any human. 
Surrounding the center were four sets of fences, one of which was charged with electrical voltage sufficient to kill a man several times over, the Marine explained. As an added security measure, vehicles carrying heavily armed Marines who had orders to shoot to kill passed any given point at 30-minute intervals on a road that ran just inside the fence line. Captain Bulkley was unconvinced that the fence line could not be penetrated by a dedicated person bent on reaching the highly sensitive buildings inside the perimeter. Hardly had the Marine colonel departed than the Navy skipper hatched a plot to put the security system to a test. If he, John Bulkley, could sneak through the four fences and avoid being electrocuted or shot by patrolling Marine guards, then so could an enterprising enemy saboteur. Shortly after midnight, Bulkley stole up to the outer fence that ringed the nuclear center. He looked like the creature from the Black Lagoon. Before leaving home, he had dressed from head to foot in Gorilla Black, as he called it, and smeared his face and hands with black grease paint. Instead of the Tommy gun and two pistols he had carried on guerrilla missions in the Philippines 18 years earlier, the one-time wild man was armed with several hand tools. He had told no one of his caper. Lying face down in the darkness, Bulkley paused and listened. The only sounds were the gentle rush of a light breeze and the merry chirping of crickets. Peering intently into the night, the skipper sized up the outer fence. It was formidable, ten feet high and crowned with barbed wire. This would be touchy business. If he were to get hung up on the chain-link fence, a passing marine patrol might shoot the unknown intruder. Working rapidly and as silently as possible, Bulkley used a cutting tool to hack a hole in the fence and wriggled through the opening. He peeked at the luminous face of his watch, right on time. The pseudo-saboteur knew that the mobile marine patrol would soon be arriving on its regular 30-minute schedule, a crucial fact that any resourceful spy could figure out for himself by merely watching the fence line from the outside for a few days, Bulkley reflected. Moments later, about a mile away, the bright lights of the security truck split the blackness. As the vehicle neared, the intruder hid in a roadside ditch. Lifting his head cautiously, Bulkley could discern the silhouette of a Marine standing behind the cab and fingering a loaded machine gun. Inside the cab, he knew, were two other Marines— a driver and a man riding shotgun, both of whom carried loaded rifles. Only a few yards from where Bulkley was sprawled, the truck rolled past and was swallowed up in the dark. Now came the acid test, penetrating the fence charged with electrical voltage. Bulkley would have to work fast. Another marine security truck would be coming along in 30 minutes. If he as much as touched the hot fence, he was dead fried to a crisp. Using cutters with rubber grips, he snipped a power line that ran for three feet from a ceramic insulator to one section of the barrier. Here, his knowledge of electricity paid off. Even though he had cut off the power to the fence section that he had chosen, there remained in the chain-link barricade a static charge that was sufficiently powerful to kill him. Using a technique he had learned as an Annapolis midshipman, Bulkley grounded that fence section, then carved out a hole with his wire cutters and slipped through the opening. Fences three and four were easy to negotiate. In two hours' time, including periods in which he had to hide from the marine patrols, Bulkley had breached the quote-unquote impenetrable security system. But his task was not yet completed. Like a giant black jungle cat, Bulkley stole across the dark terrain and slipped into a paint storage shed, emerging with several empty five-gallon cans. These he placed at strategic points in the top-secret buildings. In each container, he put a note that had been hand-printed earlier. This can represents a nuclear suitcase weapon, radio-fused to activate on a coded signal. You're dead, dummy. After the suitcase bombs had been found the next morning, Bulkley told his staff, this stunt may seem ridiculous to some people, but there is technology here that is darned important to the security of this nation, and a successful attack on this center would be exceedingly harmful. Bulkley's nocturnal caper 
had achieved the desired results. Every military officer at the nuclear center, as well as the workforce, became instantly security conscious. A short time later, the Marine Colonel's successor arrived at the center and, armed with Bulkley's suggestions, began an exhaustive overhaul of the security system. A few weeks afterward, the Navy skipper told him, Colonel, I don't think that even I can penetrate this darn place now. Thank you all for listening to this awesome story. I just love Admiral Bulkley, and we'll be doing a lot more stories on him in the future. Godspeed.